Hello, it's Scott Manley here with the next part of my series on communication satellites. So we're flashing back to the late 1960s, early 1970s. NASA has performed a miracle. It has put humans on the surface of the moon. And to do this, they needed to solve a very important problem of communication with satellites and spacecraft in low Earth orbit. And for this, they used a lot of ground stations. Because when a satellite is near the surface of the Earth, it can only see things within the sort of local horizon. And that meant that even with lots of stations all over the Earth, your typical satellite was only getting coverage about 15% of the time. They even built ships or converted ships into be, to be tracking ships. There was the Redstone and the Vanguard, which I previously talked about. So to solve this problem, they came up with a design for something called the Tracking Data Relay Satellite System. The idea is there would be satellites sitting up high in geostationary orbit, and from that perch, they could look down on satellites in low Earth orbit and talk to them, and they could also talk to ground stations, and therefore they could relay data, right? Relay satellite system. Uh, this would be an incredibly important capability for the space shuttle program, which would need to maintain communications to best, you know, suit its, uh, to best exploit its capabilities. And so, TDRS A, which would become TDRS 1, was one of the first shuttle payloads. It was carried on STS 6. This would be the first flight of Challenger. So, in March 1983, this launched, it was boosted from the payload bay towards geostationary orbit using the new inertial upper stage. The first stage of that solid rocket motor fired fine, bringing it to a transfer orbit, and then when it reached the other end, it lit the second stage. And it worked fine initially, but then they encountered a problem, which was the part of the seal in the flexible nozzle uh, basically burned through, and the spacecraft began to spin, and so it never completed the circularization and was ended up about, about 8,000 miles short of geostationary Earth orbit. But they weren't completely out of luck because the spacecraft needed propulsion with, uh, so that it could maintain its position in the orbit. And so using the tiny one-pound thrusters, they performed something like 39 maneuvers over three months, and eventually it reached its target in geostationary orbit. It would park itself over the Atlantic and uh, work from there. So the TDRS satellite was a lot like the ATS-6 satellite. If you remember, that was the large experimental satellite with fold-out uh, parab parabolic antenna. It was developed by TRW. It was about two tons, um, three axis stabilized. It had a yeah, pair of large solar panels, also a pair of large 16 feet or five meter wide fold out parabolic antennas. These could be steered towards their target. There was a, a D-shaped antenna hanging off one side, a pair of smaller parabolic antennas on the other, and the body itself was covered with an array of helical antennas. The whole spacecraft was about 57 feet across or 70 meters when everything was deployed. So yeah, it sat out at about 41 degrees west over the Atlantic. It could look down and see a base station in New Mexico, and it could see any satellites in that general vicinity. So the two large dishes, those were designed to provide specific service, single service to your targets of choice. They could rotate and they could track targets, and they provided the highest throughput capability. They either could operate in the S-band, where they would provide... Uh, at 2.1 gigahertz, they could provide 300 kilobits to the satellite and 12 megabits back. Or they could operate in the K-band at 13.8 gigahertz, uh, providing either 25 gig uh, megabits to the target or 300 megabits back to the ground. So the shuttle would be a fine example of something which would use the single access client. It would fold out its antenna, KU-band antenna that would fold out over the side of the cargo bay. And that would provide the high bandwidth capability so they could provide live television. Now, also on there, the array of 30 helical antennas. Uh, these were used by the multiple access service, which could handle something like 20 satellites simultaneously. It used the S-band uh, that was around 2.1 gigahertz again. And it was shared between multiple clients using CDMA. And it delivered data rates of about 10 kilobits up to maybe 50 kilobits depending upon uh, the direction and uh, the capability of the satellite. 
So for transmitting, only about 12 of these antenna would actually work. And in fact, they only used eight of these at any one time. The system's actually quite interesting. It used the helical antennas because that would produce soul, uh, sorry, circularly polarized radio waves. And that meant that it didn't matter what orientation the transmitters or receivers were in. So it sort of solved a lot of orientation issues that you might get. Um, but also the antenna, the array of antenna would have to operate as a phased array. And the idea with a phased array is that by selectively delaying some of the antenna and then combining all the signals, you could pretend that you've turned your array one direction or another while it is still physically in one place. Now, this is a pretty common thing. Your Starlink does it. In Tidris, however, they didn't want to have the satellite do all the math that was required for the delay and the synthesis so actually what they did was the base station would do this and it would receive 30 signals individually for each antenna. They would you know, shift these to different frequencies and transmit them on the one uh, antenna. Then the hardware on the ground would take these, shift them all back to the same frequency, apply the various um, you know, time shifts, apply the various codings, and they could pull out the relevant signals. And they could use the same set of data in different ways to, try to talk to different satellites in different locations. So all of the synthesis, all the phased array stuff was actually being performed on the ground. On transmission, they would transmit up like eight different frequencies with slightly different delays. And by the way, to be clear, you might have multiple satellites. So you're synthesizing not just eight antenna for one satellite, but eight antenna for multiple satellites that you're talking to. Yeah, this was all handled on the ground. And nowadays, of course, we do this on the satellite. So uh, let's see, there's two other large parabolic antenna. These are for talking down to the base station. Initially, this was going to be in White Sands, New Mexico. And in fact, they added a second one in New Mexico. And finally, that D-shaped antenna on the site. There's an interesting story about that because that antenna is nothing to do with NASA. It's a C-band antenna, which, if you remember, was used by commercial satellite communications networks to transmit telegrams or telegraphs or communications, phones, satellite TV. See, in the 1970s, NASA was not exactly flush with cash anymore. They were cutting a lot of uh, money that was being given to NASA, and then the shuttle was taking everything it could get. And so... NASA really wanted Tidris, and it was decided that they could pitch this as a collaboration with a private satellite communications provider uh, who could then relay ordinary garden variety TV and telegram or whatever. And Western Union got the project. They created the West Star um, Advanced, which was going to be a mission which flew on Tidris, and they would uh, work and fund large parts of Tidris and then sell the services to NASA. That was how it was supposed to work. But by the end of the 70s, shuttle was delayed. Um, Tidris was therefore des delayed as well. And uh, Westar ended up you know, deciding to sort of spread out its risk. So it became one partner with Fairchild and uh, Continental Telephone to form a company called SATCOM, and they took over the Tidris project. And then in 1982, Western Union finally gave up and you know, dropped their share. They had already launched a bunch of other Westar satellites because Tidris still wasn't ready to launch. Uh, in the end, I think uh, NASA ended up buying the hardware from Spacecom and basically paying the companies to, com to compensate them for their losses in the commercial C-band stuff. Uh, now, that wouldn't be the end of the C-band array because for Tidris 3 and 4, they would launch a re-engineered version which was designed with multiple antenna horns so that they could do communications across the oceans. And they did end up selling or licensing the service to Columbia Telecom, who worked for many years using the Tidris satellites for commercial communications capabilities across the Atlantic and the Pacific. So anyway... Uh, the addition of Tidris, once it was launched, it was a huge upgrade in communications capabilities for the space shuttle. Again, initially, before when the shuttle flights went up, they were communicating maybe 15% of the time. After Tidris, they were up well above 50% with even just one satellite operating. They were eager 
to get the next satellite up as soon as possible. And so, Tidrus 2 was going to go up in January of 1986 on board Challenger. And we all know how that went. So yeah, um, that didn't get to space ultimately, but uh, 1988, September, the return to flight Discovery, its payload is going to be Tidrus 3, or Tidrus C, because for some reason they would be named by letters before launch and then they get named with numbers after launch. I'm not sure why this is the case, but it's an interesting artifact. So yeah, this case, the spacecraft launched, it was a success, they launched the payload, it actually reached the target orbit successfully. The only downside was that the shuttle itself couldn't deploy its K-band antenna, so it couldn't actually talk to existing TDRIS so, uh, at high bandwidth, it was operating at lower performance. But anyway, having two satellites, that was the sort of baseline of the system. They could have one at 41 degrees west, another at 171 degrees west, and the satellite station at uh, New Mexico would be sort of in the middle. And between these two satellites, they could actually cover most of low Earth orbit. Now, it's not the same as talking to the surface of the Earth because satellites are at an altitude and so they can see over the curve. And so the coverage went from as low as 85% coverage when you are like at 100 miles above the surface. But if you got as high as, say, 700 miles, then you could get 100% coverage because by the time you were coming around the back of the Earth and one satellite was setting, the other one was rising. So again, depending upon how what altitude you were at, you could get fairly consistent coverage. So yeah, there's this region on the far side of the Earth from New Mexico where both satellites can't see it if it's too close to the Earth and you will lose TDRS capability there. This is called uh, the zone of exclusion. And this was a problem, certainly, a lot of shuttle missions until um, more recently when they actually added a base station in Guam. Tidrus 4 would launch in 1989, and that initially replaced Tidrus 1 over the Atlantic. But Tidrus 1 was still working. So they actually shifted it over the Pacific because Tidrus 3 was having some technical issues and they weren't sure if they would need a hot spare. So all in all, they launched six of the first generation of satellites. One was destroyed. Tidrus 7 would be the first Tidrus satellite without the commercial C-band payload. That meant that they had plenty of spare capacity on orbit. Now, Tidrus 1, if you remember, had burned a lot of its propellant getting up to geostationary Earth orbit. As part of its uh, fuel conservation protocols, let's say, they had decided to stop trying to control its inclination. You see, the Moon will pull the satellites out of the equatorial plane over time. And so most of the propellant from geostationary station keeping is actually just keeping it in that plane to stop oscillating up and down. If you eliminate that, you can still keep it on a 24 hour cycle, but it starts to wander north and south. And they decided to, they intentionally wanted this to happen because they were interested in using Tidrus 1 to serve the South Pole. And so there was a, a South Pole Tidrus relay, which got set up and initially it provided a few hours of internet service per day. And as the inclination got higher and higher by the turn of the century, it was providing over five hours of internet service per day. But you know, by that point, like the inclination was getting as high as 11 degrees. So uh, Tidrus 1 would be involved in the first pole to pole phone call where somebody used a satellite phone at the North Pole and that signal was relayed via Iridium to the ground, which was then relayed via New Mexico to Tidrus 1 to uh, you know, th the South Pole. It was also involved in a, an epic telemedicine story where the one doctor at the South Pole station, uh, Dr. Jerry Nielsen, I believe, diagnosed herself with breast cancer and using uh, some assistants who were like carpenters and welders. She did a biopsy, consulted with doctors in the US and this was the problem was uh, this was the middle of winter right this so they couldn't get people in or out and they decided to attempt a rare cargo drop in the middle of winter at the South Pole so in pitch darkness with the South Pole airfield lit up just by burning fire they dropped equipment they dropped important chemotherapy medications and uh, she was used that to treat her illness and would then be evacuated later. 
It was quite an epic story. Tidrus I would eventually be retired in 2010. That, by that point, it was something like 18 years past its initial 10-year operational life. And there's actually now, a, there's a few newer satellites even beyond that that are allowed to wander to higher and lower uh, inclinations so that they can maintain this South Pole connection. So yeah, since the initial seven, there's been two blocks of three newer generation satellites that used uh, you know higher performing technologies. These were built by Boeing. The first batch were launched on an Atlas II. The second batch upgraded again. Those were launched on Atlas V. So all in all, there have been 12 Tidris satellites launched, seven of which are still active. Two are in storage that could be brought online if there was a failure, and three are retired to graveyard orbit, although I guess they were sort of still functional at the time. Um, so the zone of exclusion now has been addressed. There's now a base station in Guam, which can talk to a satellite that's sitting over the ocean. There's two sets of terminals now at White Sands, so they can actually pair up the satellites on one side of the Earth and increase the capacity by you know, tagging them onto different uh, dedicated targets. So the capability of Tidris has grown. They have plenty of spare capacity, but... This may be the last of the Tedris network because as of like a couple of years ago, NASA has started looking at commercial providers for their on-orbit communications. They've talked to uh, you know, all the usual suspects, Inmarsat, Viasat, SES, Telesat, Kuiper, and of course, Space Exploration Technologies. Yeah, they are supposed to demonstrate on-orbit communication capabilities. I believe that with SpaceX, this is going to start with Polaris Dawn, which will, of course, have Jared uh, Isaacman doing his spacewalk, and they will be communicating with Starlink while on orbit. And so at some point, we may see that re progressively replace the on-orbit communication capabilities, or we might see something else. After all, there's a lot of satellites already up there using existing Tidris protocols, and maybe not everyone wants to switch over. Meanwhile... That does, of course, lead us neatly to what will be the subject of the next video, Satellite Constellations. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.